Hello there, welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show with I, your host, Agostino Zynga, and this is episode number 712, that's 712 of the Agostino Zynga Show with I, your host, Agostino Zynga, and I hope you're doing well wherever this podcast may find you. I hope you are doing swimmingly. How am I? All good, all things considered, I cannot complain. All good, all things considered. Now... I'm back in the hot seat and I'm really wondering what is next for Man United? I'm sat here still crying, still contemplating at our loss 3-2 at home against Galatasaray this past Tuesday. And I just think to myself, you know what? It's not going to get any better anytime soon because the crux of our issue, and I'm seeing some people on my timeline, especially on Twitter, some of my fellow Manchester United fans on the timeline are really you know exhausting themselves trying to make really rational nuanced balanced um, views and opinions and arguments for our current predicament but I think the issue that we have at hand is that you can't have a balanced nuanced common sense rational discussion debate or whatever concerning Man United because we're not a normal club normal clubs you can talk about normal things But our club is run so backwards, all those normal, rational things go out the window. The current debate now that is currently, you know, occupying most of our minds as Man United fans is should we get rid of the manager? In normal clubs, you probably would have got rid of the manager. If the results aren't going for you, if the performances aren't going for you, if there's unrest in the changing room, right? And if there's, you know, maybe the fans are not happy with the style of play or there's not a lot of good transfers, fair enough, you get rid of the manager. You get a new manager bounce and you continue from there. But unfortunately with United, you can't do that because why? We're owned by the Glazers. The Glazers have had nearly or just over 20 years of epic mismanagement of Man United to the point where we were only successful as a club when we had the greatest manager of all time, Sir Alex Ferguson, as our manager. Since he retired, since he walked away from the club, we've only been going on a somewhat downward trajectory. And that is no coincidence. It's been under the stewardship of the Glazers. They don't care about winning f- trophies. They don't care about playing good football. They don't care about evolving and developing the club. The, what they care about is taking money out of this club, which is fine. It's their prerogative. I don't like it as a fan, but fair enough. But the reason that that's an issue for us debating as Man United fans is that it's hard to have a common sense argument about what they're doing when they're not running the club like a regular owner would run the club. So if you try to get rid of Ten Hag, the manager, unfortunately, that doesn't remove the problems that Ten Hag was having. All the issues Ten Hag was having in terms of signing players, in terms of getting rid of players, in terms of evolving and developing the team and how we play and getting a handle on the changing room, all those things are a direct reason, are a direct consequence of the terrible ownership. The terrible ownership doesn't allow him to get rid of some players. So the changing room is full of players from six or seven flipping managers ago. Right? A hodgepodge of a squad. That's not going to be good for morale. He can't sign the players that he wants, the quality that he wants. So then he has to rely on his own black book. And his own black book is, guess what? Players he's already got experience with. That's why you're seeing all these players from the Dutch league or players from teams that he's managed beforehand. So you can't even blame him on that. He gives you his one or two main priorities. You don't get his priorities. Then he obviously goes to his list because he doesn't trust you guys to 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 give him any options because you can't get him the ones that he actually wants. So I don't hold him. I don't hold that against him. Then you have the really thorny issue of the lack of cohesion in our team. We don't press well. We don't play as a team. It's very individualistic. A lot of the players have big egos. And I think a lot of that has to do with some players feeling like they're, like they're untouchable. Eric Ten Hag, of course, plays a role in it because he picks some of these players. But some of our better players or some of our players in the squad have been here for a while. He can't get rid of them and they know that. They know that they're probably more powerful or they have more authority in that club than he does. So they can throw their toys out the pram. They can act like divas. They can do whatever they want. And they know most likely he's going to get fired before anybody else. Look what's happened with Jadon Sancho. The Jadon Sancho situation is a good example of it. A player who has a disagreement with a coach. The coach is not training enough, so you can't play. Calls him out publicly, which probably was uncalled for. The player then goes and releases a statement and says, hey, don't believe what you read. I'm training hard. I want to play for the team. The coach sees that as disrespectful, tells him to apologise. He says, I'm not apologising. In a normal team, the club would step in and mediate and get the player to apologise or get them out of the club. 
That's what they will do, regardless of who it is. Even though I love Jadon Sancho, a big club will mediate between the manager and the player. They would figure out a way to get the player to play and apologize, or apologize and play first, or apologize first and then play. Or they'd sell them in January if there was no ability to kind of mediate and come to some sort of re um, reconciliation. But not this club. They let him deal with it on his own, the manager. The player refuses to apologize because he knows deep down the manager probably isn't going to last until Christmas. And then we go and continue again. So we can't have rational discussions about United because we're not owned by normal, decent owners. We're just not. So in my opinion, I feel like getting rid of the manager will be the bad way to go. Because if we get rid of Derek Ten Hag, all the focus will be on getting a new manager. It'll be about, you know, sexifying some new guy who's the new person who plays a certain type of way. There'll be all this, uh, you know, hype around signings. That's going to fix everything. All these nonsense things will happen. And it will, if, if unfortunately, I feel like, put a bandage on a deep, deep wound that is the Glazers. Until we get rid of those guys. I've said it plenty of times. Actually, I need to talk about that. On Twitter Spaces, I know some of you don't even use Twitter Spaces, you don't flipping care about this, but I do. So I'm going to talk to you about it. On Twitter Spaces, there's a football spaces, you know, that also exists in that community. And people host these Twitter Spaces where people debate, you know, via voice chat about certain things about the club. And I love the phrase that people use, two phrases, let me land. And also, I've always said, I love how people say, I've always said, you guys know what I'm about. And it's like, bro. Some of us, I know me, I don't really pay attention to the speakers apart from the ones I really follow. I'm not keeping abreast of what they said, who they said it. I just follow the things I follow the time that I'm on. But some people have this really strange sense of self-importance where they think everybody remembers what they said. We don't remember what you said. Just say what you said and keep it moving. So anyway, going back to what I said before, <laughs> I think it's important that we don't get rid of the manager because it's going to take the folks away from getting rid of the owners. And until the owners leave, until the owners sell, right, or in some parallel strange universe, they crash their plane inside of a mountain, right, God forbid, or not, right, until that happens, we are never going to be a successful football club ever again. Until we get rid of those owners, we will never win a major trophy ever again. I think the history has shown it. Since we've had the Glazers in charge, we've won one FA Cup, maybe a couple of League Cups and a Europa League, eh? and some Europa League titles. That's it. But I don't count them to be major trophies apart from the FA Cup, which we won once. Until we get rid of the flipping Glazers, we will not challenge for the Champions League and we will not challenge for major trophies, the league title and the FA Cup in this country. It's not happening. You can't be successful with managers who don't care. It's impossible, especially with that toxic dressing room. It doesn't happen. So United fans, please, for the love of God. Yes, I know Aiton Hark isn't doing a good job at the moment. I know the style of play is non-existent. I know it's depressing watching us. I know it kills you every time you see us line up with Rashford and Bruno in the middle. Casemiro is even, imagine, Casemiro, bro. Casemiro is even lowering himself to our standards now. We seem to have this fucking effect when we sign players who are half decent. Suddenly, they acquiesce to our level. He came in amazingly the first season. Now, suddenly, he starts to play like everybody else. Right? I know it's depressing to see our Nana in, the, in, the, in, in between the sticks. And you think to yourself, why do we get rid of fucking um, David De Gea? I know it's depressing to still have Maguire and Johnny Evans flopping on the bench at his age. I know. But please... The focus should be on the Glazers. Focus all the attention on the Glazers. I beg of you. There's some there's some encouraging fucking news regarding that. The Qatari group, um, which obviously, obviously includes Sheikh Jassim, that wants to buy the entirety of the club, which is mostly, most United fans want a full sale. We want the club to be sold in full. We don't want the Glazers to be involved in any capacity. I would go as far as saying, whoever takes over the club should fire everybody on the executive suite of our club i think that's going to happen anyway whenever someone has a new ownership usually they get their own people in but i don't want even them to get their own leader to lead the, the group of executives no get rid of the entire boardroom entire boardroom clean sweep start again that's what i purposely would want personally before even doing the whole manager thing and the players thing come in and get rid of the entire boardroom you know make sure you change some personnel and key positions wherever it may be but they all need to be gone so whoever takes over, full boardroom change or nothing. No Glazers involvement whatsoever. So that's the encouraging thing. The sad thing is that Jim Ratcliffe, who's allegedly meant to be a United fan and who knows the pain that we have with the Glazers, is now offering to 
um, invest a uh, a percentage. I think it's like twenty five percent. He wants only partial uh, partial ownership of the club because he feels like partial ownership is the only way he's going to get over the line. I I've kind of always felt from the beginning that the Glazers never wanted to sell him for anyway. That that was my assumption or my feeling because it's gone it's gone on too long. It's approaching nearly a year I think since they put it up for sale and we still have no idea when it's actually going to go through or not. Right. And they didn't really technically put up for sale. They were fielding interest in investment. They used very interesting words. But I've always had a feeling that the Glazers never wanted to sell in full because owning United is probably, you know, it's an amazing asset to have. It's probably their most valuable asset and they can continually keep taking money out of it. It makes a lot of sense. But I always felt like what they would want is that they would want for us, ironically enough, to improve on the pitch, wait for that to happen, because they're probably thinking football's a cycle, our cycle will come, even though most of the time, good teams aren't just made on the pitch, they're made in the boardroom. You have to start by doing good work there, and then that trickles down, usually. But hey, what do I know, right? I'm just a random guy talking in my mom's bed, in my mom's flipping basement. But I felt like what they always wanted was someone to come in and overpay for partial ownership let's say somebody like Jim Ratcliffe pays 4 million for 25% which is insane because if I'm not mistaken um Sheikh Jassim and that Qatari group are offering 6 billion around that mark for the whole ownership so someone will come in with an obscene amount of money for partial ownership then they'll invest it into the club they'd redo the stadium maybe they'd redo the training ground maybe some money for transfers then we might fucking scam a champions league or something or a league cup or sorry or a league or whatever something happened along those kind of lines right we scum a trophy then that scumming of a trophy will add more value to the club then they could then go and sell the remaining 75 percent for guess what way more than what it's worth too so you could basically double dip you could get the 4 million for the 25%, you pocket that. Then after a number of years, maybe in between that we become more successful, you sell the remainder 75%, let's say for fucking 10 million. 10 billion, sorry. So now all of a sudden you're looking at making nearly 20 billion, right? For full ownership of the club when before you were offered 6 billion. That's probably how they're thinking. But in the process, who, 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 who suffers? Who? Us. Us, the fans. And I absolutely hate it. I hate it so much, man. There's no amount of people that I hate more in this world, apart from probably Dark Side Phil, than the Glazers. I absolutely detest the fucking Glazers and I can't wait for them to finally leave our club because they are abhorrent and they've destroyed the soul of my club to the point where I don't even buy flipping club merch anymore. I don't buy it. If I do, I buy it from flipping my sisters in flipping Shenzhen. I don't ever buy official merchandise from the store anymore. I don't follow the accounts. I'm not liking what they post. It's annoying. You can't even engage with your club because you feel like you're contributing to the Glazers staying longer, which is dumb, but that's how you feel. You feel like you're contributing to them staying longer. You don't put any money in their pockets. So they've ruined my experience of being a fucking fan. I want them gone. And anyway, this news courtesy of the plug um, on Twitter, sorry, the United plug, it says the Qatari group will not increase its current offer. Despite the threat of a new offer from Jim Ratcliffe, sources close to the group say the news of Ratcliffe's restructured offer constitutes another means to pressure intended um, to make the, them increase the offer. So they're feeling like they are putting out that story about the 25% because they want the Qatari group to increase the offer and give them over the odds. Most likely, the Glazers probably want 10 billion, I'm assuming. Judging by how greedy they are, they probably want 10 bill. 10 bill and they walk away. But until then, they'll keep fucking bleeding the club dry. Um, and then I guess because we keep complaining online too, I would imagine they, in a backwards way of their thinking, right? In their fucking lizard, leechy brain of thinking, they probably think when we complain, it actually puts more pressure on the Qatari group to increase their offer too. Maybe. I don't know. But either way, I want them out. Especially after watching Newcastle fucking thump PSG at home 4-1. We see what can happen when good owners come in, take over. And again, look how Newcastle have done it. They didn't even do it in a crazy way that we all assumed they would do it. They've done it with a mix of, you know, quote-unquote local talent, a mix of buying players. They've stepped, you know, they, they, they kept faith with Eddie Howe and shown him a lot of trust and stuff, and he stepped up. The players have stepped up. There's a good vibes around the fucking place. I'm sure all those Geordies, you know, were fucking going crazy last night. Probably bare people called in sick. Probably everybody's got the coke sniffles the next morning. They're loving it. They're loving supporting their club, and that's what I want. That's all I want. Is that much to ask for? I don't think so. But hey, what do I know? What do I bloody know? Nothing, I tell you. Second to talk about this. I was thinking, right, when I saw this tweet going viral on my side of fucking social media, I'm thinking to myself, 
Am I maybe the problem? Do I maybe not get it? Because I don't understand why this stuff has become so popular within the black content creator community. And what am I talking about? Relationship and sex content. Why do we always talk about this shit? Don't get me wrong. I'm not the target demographic. I don't really listen to these shows for the most part because all of their topics are fucking the same. But whenever I see some of their clips going viral, whenever I see all the engagement that they get in, whenever I see the conversations around it, clearly these clips and these shows are incredibly popular. More popular than my platform is at this current moment. So I, they obviously must be way more fans of this than I am. And maybe it's something that I don't get. But honestly, why are people still talking about this type of stuff? Like this caption from this lady called, what is she called? The Grand of, Grand, what's that? Grand DFT Noise on Twitter. She posted this clip of these two guys on a show. I don't know what it's called. Um, I think it's called Channel 4.0. Uh, maybe that's a channel. It's something to do with relationship, right? And they already, the clip itself on Twitter has 3.5 million views. It has 800 and 885 replies, 7,282 reposts, 11.5 thousand likes, and 3,309 bookmarks. Plenty of people are loving this stuff. So maybe it's just me. Maybe it must just be me who doesn't get what's going on here. But we're going to actually play the clip from this thing and see what exactly they're talking about because i don't get why this same content about well, how much you should spend on the first date should you hold the door open would you sleep with a girl or be in a relationship with a girl if she had a child how much money like all this stuff is like bro can we be can the lord above please deliver us from the scourge of talking about relationships and sex on podcasts day in day out like on my life on my life i have never never sat around with a group of people in real life irl right touching 4k all that shit and spoken about relationships and sex as much never i don't think regular people do maybe i'm maybe i'm in the wrong here maybe you tell me maybe you you're at home or with you your friends on the group chat you're talking about fucking men and women dating habits relationship stuff when should you have a baby when's a good time to get married would you take the person's last name maybe you talk about this all the time but i don't know anybody in real life who does this like honestly this really makes my mind, my brain want to leak out of my earlobes of how bad this is. But anyway, let's hear what they have to say here. And let's hear what this interesting 3.5 million view content is sounding like. Because maybe I'm the one that doesn't get it. Maybe I'm the one that doesn't get it. Taking a girl on a date, what cuisine are we looking at? Um, took a girl to a place called Monkey House, yeah. And mm. I didn't know how expensive it was. And you know how it is. When you're going out and you're Them buying places drinks, are expensive, expensive for drink. So, so she's ordered like four cocktails, yeah. And she hasn't even ordered her food yet. It's coming up to like 40 quid. I've only got a bill 50. So I started to like saying, I ain't even that hungry, you know? She's like, well, I'm, I'm hungry. I'm going to order. So I've gone to the toilet and I've texted my boy. He's not answering. So I've called him. I said, brother, please. I need money. I need like a bill 50. I'll run it back to you. So all I'm doing during the day is literally just doing this. Refreshing. Refreshing. Just trying to see the balance has changed. So I'm sweating now, yeah? And then she's like, oh, do you want more? Should we get more drinks? In my head, I'm like, this is where it's gonna go left because if I if I say no, yeah, you can't say no. I can't say no, so I'm gonna. It's up to you. She's ordered more drinks now. I've then thought, yeah, this is peak. I'm gonna have to ask her to borrow me some money or let's go halves or something. I just thought, let me just refresh again, and I saw three hundred pound in there. One fifty. Oh, uh, big bro, up bro scheme, man. Fabe, Fabe. I right, Fabe, big up Shout yourself, out Fabe. man. Fabe knows the story anyway. It gave me confidence in it, but it made me realize I can't do this. Mm. This is like living on the edge. Mm. So yeah, that was my my worst experience I've ever had. Now, don't get me wrong. It's a funny story. Um, I do understand why people would like it. I get it. But honestly, has this been the first time you've ever heard of somebody going to a date and maybe being worried and sweating buckets about how much it's going to cost? We all know what the common sense argument is behind it because you really should be checking the prices of places you want to go to before you get there. No wishes in your budget. I really am not the big believer personally. In my humble opinion, I'm not the biggest believer of going out with a tight budget. I don't understand people that do that. I'd much rather spend that money and have a good time at home or do other things or wait until I've come up because I like to, I'm very, um, what's that thing called? I'm very, um, 
I'm more of a lifestyle type of guy. I might not like material things. I don't care about having a Rolls Royce, a Lamborghini, uh, Odomar watch or whatever, AP, a Rolex, having a gold house. I don't care about that shit, but I care more about lifestyle. I care more about being able to stay in the places I want to stay in, be able to pay for my meal without looking at the bill, be able to travel where I want to travel. That's really important to me. So on a little level that I'm at now, at the little level that I'm at now, where I'm going to get to the top, at a little level that I'm at now, I am not willing to go on holiday and live like a rat for 50, with 50 euros in my pocket. I would have done that maybe when I was 18. Like when I'm 18, I've got like an 18 year old budget. But the older you get, the more you earn, the more things that you kind of, you know, you can't live without. For instance, I'm going to, I'm going to buy a ticket. I'm probably going to take check-in luggage with me because I want to have a different outfit for the whole weekend I'm going. Even if it's four days, I want a different outfit every day. I might even take four pairs of shoes. Don't judge me. It's just the way that I'm, it's just the way that I am. I want to have also to make sure that I have 100 euros at least a bit of spending money per day. Cool. Whatever needs to be done. I want to make sure I have money to drink. Cool. It needs to be done. But I'm not going to go to the tight budget. So you kind of have these things in your head that you kind of work out. Same thing I would imagine when it comes to dating. Why would you go out with somebody who you're willing to invite, right? Which means you're probably going to pay for their half of the meal. Why would you go on like a meal like that on a tight budget? It makes no sense, right? Even if you went to... Even if you went to fucking Wagamama's, I would, I would assume 150 Wagamama's for a meal of two plus drinks is probably about what you're going to pay to go Wagamama's. Probably, I'd imagine. Even maybe even Nando's, depending on how the, how you, how the night goes, you could easily spend a bill there, easily. So whatever, that, that, that needs to be said. But for me, I'm like, why must these topics keep coming up again and again and again and again? Surely we are tired of talking about these things as people. But maybe we're not. And maybe I'm in the minority. Maybe I'm one person out there of the few who actually cannot see themselves ever spending any of this free time sitting there thinking and pontificating about and arguing in my own head about who is a better sex. Men or women? Um, do women... Um, can women make you laugh? Do men deserve to have feelings? Um, um, would you date someone that had a kid? Um, what do you think of this? Like, oh my God, why do we care so much about these things? Is it because it's the easiest way to make content? And again, maybe it's just exists in each community, but I see a lot more with um, people that look like myself, of course, black content creators and shit. Maybe it exists in all communities, but I just can't get around why we see to see the same content now across all of them. Think of all the big UK content creators out there that have podcasts. Think of all their shows. Now think of their topics. It's all the same. Don't get me wrong. I talk about the same shit on here too, but I'm not fucking, you know, pontificating about love and relationships every single episode. It's boring, man. Like, God almighty. I'm tired of it. Leave us alone. No one cares. Okay, cool. You went on a date. You didn't have enough money. You asked your friend for, for some money. That's actually a good story. The bit about the friend. When you, like, you, you know, you know who your friends are when in a, in a situation like that that you put yourself into, they still want to step up and help you out. Don't get me wrong. I would never, number one, go out with just enough money to pay for just enough of the date not gonna happen i want to have a bit more so i can be like relax and you know we could take chances and do whatever needs to be done and be spontaneous that's me personally number two if i was in that position i'm not asking anybody for anything that person across from me has to split it with me because we're eating together but i'm not then gonna call somebody up who has it's none of their business right they weren't involved they didn't put you know twist my arm and make, make, make me pet taste person on the date they're not getting anything out of it either, right? And now all of a sudden I'm asking them to fucking contribute 150 quid to this day. I would never do that to somebody ever. Ever, 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 ever. But hey, maybe I'm in the minority. Maybe I'm in the minority. Anyway, moving on from this, we've got interesting development to talk about here. So I've been following a lot of this DJ MV, Caesar Pena, um, property developing fraud thing that's been going on at the moment, right? And it's been on my life, one of the most interesting things to kind of watch and to analyze or to see from afar. Because in general, the story goes um, that Cesar Pena was this property developing guy um, who's also unfortunately a uh, ex-convict. And he got done, I think, for fraud or something, right? He comes out, he changes persona, and he becomes a flipping houses guy. And this, I think, started, oddly enough, it started right before the pandemic. So these guys were very fortunate, but also very conniving. The whole flipping houses thing started in, during the pandemic. The economic downturn around the world started just before the pandemic. Everyone was trying to find a way to make money, to get out of the situation they were in. The pandemic kind of put a stranglehold on a lot of people who 
definitely didn't have any options to do anything, right? You couldn't move away. You couldn't go on a holiday. It kind of revealed, you know, the difference, the, the, the benefits of having money and being able to be flexible and do what you want to do. And maybe people then think, okay, entrepreneur ideas, let me think, let me think of stuff to do. The guys are flipping houses come along and in the black and brown community, for the most part, I know from growing up in a very poor neighborhood, usually the property developing or property ladder is one of the only ways you can actually ascend the class level, especially or the class system in the UK or just in general, just accumulate any kind of wealth really and truly because it's very difficult for us for whatever reason to get loans and stuff especially if you've got bad credit or you come from a particular type of place it's just hard to set up businesses people don't really have the financial literacy to do so but housing and property developing all this type of stuff we can probably do so these guys come in um Cesar Peña is doing the property developing thing then he links up with DJ Envy a celebrity in, in his own sense because he's the host of, of the DJ um of the breakfast club they link up together. He brings them on his fucking platform and then they start to push this thing of, hey, invest in us and then we'll make you money, basically. That's the idea. The idea behind it was that they had all these properties. You'd put your money into a pool and then they'd give you a return. And I think they said the return was guaranteed at like 30%, which is insane. No one could guarantee any returns, let alone 30. But they said, if you give us 100 grand, we'll give you 130,000 back. So obviously, if you're down bad, or even if you're just trying to find a way out of your current situation and you've got these savings burning a hole in your pocket and you want to make some money, quick money and flip it quickly, you put it into these guys, you trust them, they're showing you houses and they're on building sites wearing fucking, you know, um, safety vests and shit and helmets and hard hats. You take them seriously. They do it, but guess what happens? It was all a lie. All that money that people were giving to them wasn't going into making the houses. It was just all going into paying other investors off and they were keeping the difference. And it wasn't even like they did the business to begin with, then they stopped. No, it was a Ponzi scheme from day dot, from zero. They're saying it was a Ponzi scheme. So now, obviously, everybody involved who lost money is suing both um, DJMV and Cesar Pena. DJMV, in, in consequent times, has come out and said, hey, I'm a victim too. I'm not fucking guilty of this. But obviously, he is because there's plenty of content out that people have been able to scrape from his own social media and the site, which has now been taken down, which is funnily enough, they, they've taken all the, you know, um, decriminating or criminating, you know, um, incriminating, sorry, um, pictures of DJ Envy and Cesar Pena off of their site, but everybody's always finding them because the internet never forgets. And now, because everybody's calling out DJ Envy and saying, hey, you're not a victim, you've perpetrated this lie, and some people are even going as far as saying, hey, we wouldn't have known who Cesar Pena was if it wasn't for you. You brought him on your nationally syndicated, super popular morning show, right? One of the biggest shows in hip hop or in black culture, especially in America and you promoted him to us, it seems trustworthy. That's why we believed it. So they're pop, purpo they're, 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 they are purposely putting blame directly, obviously, on the scammer and obviously on DJ Envy. But then DJ Envy now is getting upset with YouTubers and bloggers who are talking about it because they're obviously exposing it and putting an onus on him, making him look bad. He's now doing the thing that I've never understood that people do when they get in trouble. He's now suing people who are talking about it. He's now issuing out cease and desist to Tony the Closer and the credit guy, who are two people who played an instrumental role in exposing him and his part that he played in this scam. And this is a clip from Chick's Move that talks about it. Absolutely crazy that he would do this. I don't get why people do this and think this is a good idea. This is absolutely insane. So let me play the clip for you so you can hear what they're saying. Bear with me a second as it loads here behind the screen and then we'll continue. But DGMV is suing um, Tony the Closer and the credit dude because. They're exposing his role in this flipping houses scheme scam thing that he was a part of. It's absolutely probably one of the most heinous things and shambolic things that I've seen in my entire life. I swear to God it is. It's so heinous, so shameful, so shambolic. And I'm going to play the clip for you right now. Oh, DJ Envy has officially issued a lawsuit. No, guys, not to Caesar to Tony the Closer. Now, after sending Tony a cease and desist letter to stop talking about the alleged real estate fraud, Tony the Closer has announced that Envy is suing him and also the credit dude. He said, breaking news, DJ Envy is suing both me and the credit dude for shining a light on his shady dealings with Caesar. Funny how the truth stings, huh? The credit dude, once Envy's business partner, saw the light and helped expose the scam. Now, we're in this legal maze, standing up for what's right. Now, that did not stop Tony the Closer from continuing to speak about DJ Envy. He actually held a Twitter space last night where he was talking with alleged victims of Envy and Caesar's real estate fraud scheme. He said, damn, today 
today's spaces had victims of the envy frauds connect and even discovered that they were on the same property wow Jesus. looks like envy is sending out these cease and desist letters to any public figure speaking out on the issue funk flex revealed that he was also sent a letter by envy's lawyer he said i got this from envy back in july you think he's gonna send this to rick ross now cease and desist the credit dude who was dj envy's alleged partner he spoke out last month to separate himself he said the credit dude is not involved in the allegations against dj envy or Caesar Pena in regards to the real estate ponzi scheme they're accused of running we've had a lot of clients try to lump us into their web of lies and deception as well as accuse us of being involved in their bad business dealings not only is it further from the truth but i am also a victim of both their manipulative behavior it's unfortunate when people you trusted hurt you but to also think they only helped to throw it in my face and once i stood up for myself you filed a fictitious lawsuit against me not only will justice prevail but they will be exposed for being the alleged liars and cheaters everyone is saying they are so there you guys crazy right absolutely fucking crazy i've never understood that that is um that is the uh, i forgot the actual term for it um there's a lady that they named it after where you uh, you know in an effort to try and you know get that divert the attention away from the bad thing that you do you actually bring more attention to it in an effort to hide something you actually end up getting more eyes onto it which is really really crazy but um it's just a common tactic a lot of these guys do on especially now that with social media the way it is you'd imagine they'd know once a cat is out the bag the cat is out the bag there is no effort there is no way to really stem the tide against you the only way to stem the tide against you is to be a truth seeker come out expose what actually happened if you are an actual victim present that case as thoroughly as you can and then hope the public of court the 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 court of public opinion agrees with you but you can't do it through the courts with cease and desist and gag orders and shit and trying to silence people it's just going to make you look way more guilty than what you actually are or maybe you are as guilty as they say but the funny thing about this whole scam that's been very funny to me to realize is that you know it's also revealed to me it's revealed to me the power of influence and why influencers are probably undervalued and I think that's something Gary Vee speaks about a lot, right? Gary Vee has a bad reputation for a lot of people out there, but I think there are usually some crumbs of gems of wisdom you can get from his content. And I remember him saying from the very beginning when influencer marketing was taking off and doing what it was doing, that influencers by and large are undervalued. And I think I'm starting to agree with that because I don't think that Caesar Pena guy could have committed this level of a scam or this level of fraud and you know scammed so many people out of millions i think tony the closer the guy who revealed this scam and kind of blew it up he said that running total now at the moment from the victims he's spoken to and the people that are on the ground level who know knowledge of stuff behind the scenes the amount they're speaking about from again think about it from maybe 2019 to now the total amount that's been that's been scammed 44 million dollars 44 million dollars is allegedly the final total and it's obviously still running because people still have to come out and obviously um add themselves to a lawsuit if they need be if they have the money to do so if they're still around because there's been some you know instances and reports of people trying to self-expire because of the stress of everything going on and because of the embarrassment and shame which is something i also didn't think about when it comes to financial scams a lot of it why people get away with it is because people who deem themselves to be smart and intelligent and maybe business savvy when they get scammed they kind of feel shamed right they feel fucking like idiots that they got scammed and the last thing they want to do is get in front of a camera or put their name on a lawsuit and reveal how much they got scammed for because it makes them feel bad right that's kind of what some of these scammers kind of prey on but can you imagine someone like a Caesar Pena ever being able to run off with 44 million dollars plus of worth of people's money i don't think so he only did that because of his connection with dj envy so that proves that influencers or famous people people with clout their value is underrated because people only trusted which is weird they trusted these guys only because they were from the quote-unquote same community as them they look like them they listen to the same music dress like them all this sort of nonsense and because this guy was a radio dj which is interesting because i think there's also another theory out there with people who are saying the amount of money that they were scamming from people it just seems crazy to be scamming that much just to live a rich lifestyle because both guys although they weren't super rich they were rich enough to live that lifestyle of like driving nice cars having big houses so why would they need that much money to like do you know whatever they're doing and there's a theory out there that says that maybe they were involved in drug dealing also allegedly that's the theory going around now there, there is some sort of drug dealing arm um, to this business 
that maybe they were using the money to launder it through the building thing to then wash it together with the drug money maybe they're using the money they're scamming from the fans to buy drugs in the first place whatever there's some element people i think organized crime and drug trafficking is involved which is be absolutely crazy to get like a real estate rico and get a drug you know rico as well at the same point would be absolutely crazy if that happened but one of the real kind of alarm bells ringing which again i think is very much an american thing because i don't think we have it we do have it in the uk but when people do it in the uk there is a lot more kind of like Ew, that's a bit gross here we don't really have the same kind of you know culture around it but they're saying that dj envy's instagram may be one of his down maybe his um maybe something that, <gasps> that that will end up costing him a lot because they're saying how can somebody that is allegedly only a radio dj don't get me wrong a really famous one breakfast club is huge might not be as popular as it once was, but it's still a really popular show. They've got a really popular podcast. It does really good numbers on YouTube. I'm sure on social media they get a lot of money. And it's a syndicated radio show, which means it basically is played all across fucking the United States early in the morning. Cool. And I'm sure he gets loads of gigs out of that as well as a side gig. But if you go on DJ Envy's Instagram, especially before this, this whole scam kicked off, maybe he scrubbed his account now. But if you went on it before, you would never know that he was just a rapper. You would think he used to play baseball or something or whatever because his life is crazy, right? He's got all these crazy cars. He's got all these chains, his crazy house. His kids look like they've never missed a meal. It's really mad. And then people are saying, hey, maybe this Instagram account will he be his downfall because his spending habits on Instagram don't match the job that he allegedly has or the jobs that he has club dj and a radio dj or radio presenter probably doesn't equal up to having like 17 bugattis and shit it doesn't really make any sense right so people are alleging that that might be one of his downfalls i think to myself yeah we don't really have the same culture in the uk we don't really have people out here flossing their homes or stacks of money doing the money phone doing all the cars thing that's not really a thing that we do especially in london you probably shouldn't do it because if you do like what happened to Molly May, that flipping um, influencer, you end up getting your house robbed the next stage. I mean, um, thieves and robbers and burglars and shit are always keeping an eye out on those things. But it's just not something that people do. It's just not done. I think the most thing people do is maybe flex their lifestyle. So you see somebody, I'm flying to this place. I'm flying to that place. I'm staying in this place. I'm staying in that place. That is usually a very easy signal of somebody that has a lot of money and a lot of free time to do what they want. But you don't really see people posting up with their trappings of their fucking riches and shit standing in front of rolls royces and whatnot it's just not something that we do um and i wonder why that is i really do maybe it's because we're haters deep down i don't really know but still um prayers to all the victims involved in the scam there is another sad aspect about it which is likely none of them are going to get their money back that's a really sad thing about it but at least DJ Envy and co are going to be exposed for what they've done and we're hopefully going to get to a point where in the future people will be a little bit more especially in the black community or in the black and brown community people will be a little bit a little bit more cautious about just giving their money to people that are well known because they're well known because that is also kind of insane to give your hard-earned money in cash to people to invest in properties because you heard their name you heard their voice on the radio it's fucking wild they have no business you know under you know they have no business experience no history no nothing and you're just giving them money because you trust them because they're famous online it's just fucking crazy and hopefully this will kind of shine a light on that going forward one can only hope continuing on from that is quick update regarding the issue that i was speaking on prior regarding the hs2 rail here in the uk which unfortunately has now been confirmed to be scrapped um richie sunak our uk prime minister spoke about it at the conservative fucking thing that they go, got going on in manchester i'm not sure what the hell it's called but who cares but he spoke about it over there but the interesting thing about it is that isn't politics interesting you got this amazing new rail line that's been proposed. What was it? I think they said like it was 10 years in the making or maybe even 20 years in the making. The idea behind it was to connect parts of the Midlands and up north with parts of the south and allow this high speed rail to connect London to Manchester and Manchester to other parts of the Midlands and shit. And to basically allow people in that part of the country to have a means to go to all these major cities near and around them without having to jump on trains that take two and a half hours to get there. So maybe a high speed rail can take you from Birmingham to Manchester or leads to fucking birmingham in maybe half or maybe a quarter of the time they'll take you on a normal train so that would also you know benefit the economy it allow people in london like myself to even maybe travel to those places more often you might have the ability to maybe um go and have a job in those type of areas it might allow them the employers to have ability to hire more high caliber employees it might increase the property price in those areas the prospects and the possibilities are endless but effectively what it would do is that it would boost the economy overall that's what it would do 
the conservatives come in and say, nope, it's costing too much. We're going to scrap it because obviously they have a preference to the South all the time and they don't want to overspend. And there's this really crazy North-South divide that exists here in the UK, which is odd. Cool. Richie Sunak is it's going to be, it gets leaked out. It's going to be scrapped. Richie Sunak is, is avoiding to fucking confirm it until he speaks. He finally does confirm it when he speaks. But then he then throws a weird kind of curveball out of nowhere. He then starts talking about the trans issue. And I'm like, this is what politics is about, isn't it? Instead of talking about the things that actually matter to regular civilians, you start talking about cultural war, hot button, social media topics to distract from the fact that you failed to fucking fulfill the promise of this high-speed rail line that would have benefited the lives of hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people here in the UK. And instead, we are getting, in, we're getting into this fucking stupid mudslinging argument about trans issues that regular people on the street don't really give a fuck about they don't care they really don't what they care about is looking after them themselves and their family and they want everybody to live a fun free life wherever they want to do for the most part but of course politics people know you throw out this little curveball and it does distract from the point of what you are there to do which is help the you know help your fucking citizens right and no let's talk about cultural war stuff absolutely heinous here's a clip of rishi sunak right after canceling the hs2 line talking about trans issues absolutely weird and it also shouldn't be controversial for parents to know what their children are being taught in school about relationships. Patients should know when hospitals are talking about men or women. And we shouldn't get bullied. <laughs> and we shouldn't get bullied into believing that people can be any sex they want to be. They can't. A man is a man, and a woman is a woman. That's just common sense. Hey, yo, bro, we just want fucking high-speed rail. We just want a train that can take us from London to Manchester to parts of other parts of the Midlands with ease. That's all we want. We don't care about these issues. Regular people do not care about these issues, honestly, especially now. Especially now with the economy being the way that it is, these issues really do fall down the list of priorities. Maybe in other times where maybe there is an argument to be had out there, what people flow out sometimes. I hear Joe Rogan talk about it, about, oh, people usually care about these cultural war issues when times are good. I think it's been proven to be incorrect, that statement, right? Because times are bad now and people are still fucking, you know, shouting about, um, you know, fucking trans athletes in sports about fucking, you know, uh, non-binary um, toilets and stuff online. Stuff that really doesn't matter in the grand scheme of things. People are still wasting their time and energy arguing about it with randoms online who they don't know if that person's a 14-year-old boy or a 60-year-old man. It's a nonsense, really. And the policies and things that they should be, you know, benefiting regular people they don't focus on. And that's probably why I've never really had an interest in politics and why I don't follow it. It's exhausting. Because the policies and issues that really do affect regular people, they don't pick, keep attention on it or pay attention to it because it's going to cost them something. It's going to cost them money. It's going to maybe cost them seats. It might cost them votes. It might cost them reputationally. But talking about these nonsense topics, just going around in circles, it doesn't cost anything to speak continually about these nonsense things. It's really, really sad. Um, so this is the confirmation here courtesy of Politico. It says Richie Sunak scraps northern leg of the HS2 rail line. You see some uh, pictures here of the work that was going on at the time with the cranes. It says a, H2, a HS2, a multi-billion pound high-speed rail route to connect Leeds, Birmingham, Manchester to London was announced by then Prime Minister David Cameron in 2013. Originally meant to connect the north of England to the capital of London, Sunak announced on Wednesday that the rest of the HS2 project will be cancelled. Refer ref sorry, referring to everything beyond a line from London to Birmingham in the mid um, in the West Midlands, sorry, which is already under constructions. So the London to West Midlands train is still going to get done. Funny that, isn't it? Right. So the South still just wins at the end of the day. They scrapped the rest of it, but for us Londoners, we're still going to get some benefit. Great. In this speech at the Conservative Party conference in Manchester, um, the Prime Minister said the reigning 36 billion earmarked to HS2 will be instead reinvested into hundreds of new transport projects in the North and Midlands across the country. Absolutely false. I've got a feeling that a lot of that money will probably get misused and a lot of that money will probably end up in brown envelopes, most likely allegedly announcing the changes sunak said i say that those who backed the project in the first place the facts have changed 
And the right thing to do when the facts change is to have courage to change direction. We waste a lot of money on a lot of things in the UK. I find it very interesting that as soon as we're losing money on a project that benefits parts of the country that aren't just the South, suddenly everybody becomes a every, everybody becomes financially prudent. It's really crazy. Um, the Prime Minister said that he would be he would protect the 12 billion um, to link up Manchester and Liverpool as planned and also vow to build a new Midlands rail hub to connect 50 different stations. He said that he would extend the West Midlands Metro, build a tram system in Leeds and electrify the Northwest Mail Line as well as in upgrading the series of major roads. All those things you could not do and just focus on connecting the HS2 and fulfilling that plan. Really and truly, if you think about it, you're probably going to spend just about as close enough the figure that you would have spent on building the remainder of it once it finally goes through then all these improvements that are just going to be band-aids on issues really and truly because that's something that we miss you know compared to europe europe has great high-speed rail parts of other parts of the world especially in you know in asia they have really really good um, um what you call high-speed rail also but we don't there's not a lot of high-speed rail connecting parts of you know, regional parts of the UK with each other, which is really strange when you consider everything that's going on with the country at the moment. The Prime Minister said that da, da, da. Um, Sunak vowed that he would create a new Eastern development zone wherein thousands of new homes will replace the current holdings, uh, building sites from the HS2 terminal lines. While HS2 is deeply controversial, with some conservatives concerned with the spiraling costs and disrupting, the move is likely to generate a backlash from local leaders. Of course it is. And here's some of the backlash. Um, you see HS2 will not go into Houston without private funds. So that whole Houston line connection isn't going to happen until private firms step up and cough up the cash funny hilarious and then we've got a final here headline cursor bbc hs2 no new compensation for pain of people affected by the scrap rail because people obviously were trying to anticipate the launch of hs2 and buy properties um, start businesses whatever open offices there and now it's been scrapped it's put people basically in a red and now they've got homes and houses that are probably not going to be of any use to them because they can't get any money out of them. And of course, the government, are they going to offer compensation for these people? Of course not. Are they going to line their pockets with the money that's re remaining from this HS2 project that's been scrapped? Probably. Absolutely heinous. Absolutely heinous. Moving on, I want to talk about this and I want to feature this and give you guys a big shout out and make sure that you guys listen to this. So, Compilation V1 courtesy of 1017 Alex 9SM is from none other than my hero, Matthew M. Williams, the founder and fashion director over there at Elix and also the director over there, also oh, the, the director of fashion over there at Givenchy, right? He's an amazing guy. Um, he started from the bottom when it comes from streetwear and now has ascended to the top, top of fashion with a capital F being able to spearhead Givenchy and essentially breathe new life, breathe new life into that house right and i've always been a big fan of his always 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 especially considering you know his start from doing the stuff that he was doing with lady gaga and basically being a costume designer and creative director to then the stuff that he was doing with the bin trill guys which included heron preston who's now going to do big and amazing things working with h&m and his own brand and of course justin saunders who is now um firmly known as being the jound guy and now matthew m williams is now branching into music how cool is that? He's now doing music under the moniker of his brand Elix, which is officially called 1017 Elix 9SM. And I'm sure the 1017 comes from Brick Squad um, in terms of um, Gucci Mane's fucking label. And now he's doing his own compilation of music where he's basically working with a lot of these young up and coming artists who he's big fans of, who he has sometimes watched the show, walked the show, um, starring campaigns, personal relationship. We all know his relationship with Playboy Carti that played a big role in the rollout of Whole Lot of Red. And now he released Compilation V1 that features so many different flipping artists from Hard Rock, Tezo Touchdown, Little Yatty, Kid Cudi. Um, you've got Ethel Kane on there, interestingly enough, Jam City, BK, BK, BK the Ruler, Lancey Foe, who I'm a big fan of, um, Saudi Money, um, Cheb Rabi, loads of amazing people on there, Helsinki Crow, like great, great artists. And I really recommend you check it out. It's a really good little mixtape. It's only what, 16 tracks long. A um, couple of the tracks on there, like the Ethel Kane one, are probably, you know, not, they don't really probably fit the theme of what's going on. But you can still imagine this type of, you know, mixtape or compilation is probably a scientific a scientification or it's probably a, the rounding up of all the music 
that Matthew M. Williams and that whole design team listens to when they're designing in the studio. It's probably what he plays on his, on his flipping Spotify when he's training, when he's in a car and shit. This is kind of a really good way to kind of surmise his taste level. And it made me think, actually, maybe I should start getting back into doing online radio shows again. I never listened to an online radio show myself personally, which is odd. But, you know, stuff like NTS radio and stuff just isn't for me. There's a particular kind of person who rolls their own cigarettes and wears white socks, you know, and kind of has dandruff and shit and wears, ironically, those, you know, barber jackets and whatnot. That's how person I envision listening to NTS. I'm never going to be that guy. But I also have a real urge to share my taste level and my kind of musical um you know um broad the broadness of my musical taste with people and the one way to do it outside of a dj mix is actually doing a radio show where you play like different tunes from different genres and shit all on one show you introduce a couple of tunes maybe share some personal stories and anecdotes and whatnot it's different from a mix because it's not like a party thing you're not trying to get people to dance you're just trying to show off how much cool music you're into and i feel like i'm into a lot of cool music that people don't really know about so Maybe I will start doing radio DJ type mixes type of things because that's kind of similar to what this guy's doing with the compilation. It kind of makes it look a bit similar to what Drake was doing when he put out his compilation. I forgot what it was called. What was that compilation that Drake put out ages ago? Um, oh, that's the one, Care Package. When he put out Care Package and he's put out a few of these type of things where instead of making an album where it's telling a thematic story, um, you're basically making an album of these different sounds and moments that you captured during your time out and around Frolic and living your life and shit. And this is what we get from Compilation V1. My favourite track from this has to be Water by Tezo Touchdown. Like, Tezo Touchdown, again, is proving to me why, how, how much of a frustrating artist he is. Drake gassed up his album. The whole industry gassed up his album when it came out, and it's very underwhelming. I haven't listened to it again since it dropped, unfortunately. But before that, his features, he did not miss. He had hit after hit after hit after hit when it comes to features, and he does the same thing on Compilation V1. Why is he able to do so well on features, like 10 out of 10 level? to them being a quite a mediocre album artist i don't get it because musically sonically artistically he's clearly got something about him but i don't know why the albums just don't sound great i don't know whatever the the track water by tezo touchdown on this compilation v1 flipping uh tape by 1017 alex 9sm is absolutely banging there's a kid cuddy track on there which is actually good too kid cuddy's had a lot of misses over the last few years he's actually meant to be releasing an album i think called insano or something that's got 40 tracks which i'm dreading because you know he's been putting out a lot of duds i don't know if the world needs 40 dud tracks of kid cuddy moaning and groaning and shit it's been terrible to see him like this um the ethel kane track i'm not really a big fan of the lancey foe track is absolutely crazy and also is a filthy and a fousy track and i actually did listen to the i've got to check out filthy because filthy if i'm not mistaken is it filthy or somebody else i think it's filthy maybe it's somebody else who is it there's a particular artist i forgot his name oh that's it it's um calvin crush Calvin Crashes, if I'm not mistaken, has gone on to start doing his own music now. So similar to um, Pierre Bourne, he's now becoming his own guy. So I'm actually curious to see what that sounds like because there must be... There's something really interesting about these artists who start off be being just bona fide producers but then decide to then do their own music because there is an instinct and a tendency to try and keep the records that are great for yourself. But because you're not that well-known of an artist... Maybe it's better that you just give them to the better artists to use them themselves instead of keeping them yourself. Do you know what I mean? But you can only, you know, I don't know. Like, Pierre Bourne's got the same sort of issue. A lot of the tracks that he has that, that are his, you'd imagine somebody else on them. Like, woo, it'd be crazy. But yeah, um, Kelvin Crash does actually have a tape out at the moment. It's called Harsh. It's available now on Apple Music. Check it out if you are interested because Kelvin Crash actually um, made the... He didn't make the intro that I have on my podcast. The intro is actually taken from a ASAP Rocky track that I just looped. That I think did it eventually come out. I don't know if it eventually came out, but he's a really good fucking producer. He's absolutely incredible. And um, yeah, he's got an album called Harsh now at the moment. So I'm curious to actually listen to that and hear if it's just him. Yeah, it's him. There's him with Rocky, and there's a feature also with a person called Cuckoo Chloe. Um, but for, apart from that, it's just all him. 13 tracks i'm eager to see what that sounds like but anyway for the time being please check out 1017 9sm compilation v1 by um matthew williams obviously of elites and obviously of gs of fucking Givenchy. it's absolutely incredible um again it shows why these 
label why these houses want to hire people like matthew williams from the streetwear world yes he doesn't have conventional fashion experience yes he didn't go to the conventional fashion schools yes he didn't have you know work under the tutelage of a big name fashion designer but what you get from streetwear guys is the ability to encapsulate everything they can pull from architecture automobile automobile design industrial design um you know music art whatever they can all synthesize it all in under one umbrella and everything kind of adds to it like having a cool mixtape adds to the allure and to the cachet of fucking elites which then adds to the allure and cachet and appeal of Givenchy it's all fucking secular and I fucking love it and they do it all of their own volition Givenchy isn't asking Matthew M. Williams to make this compilation. They're not telling him, hey, be a bit cooler. Go out there and do cool things. He's just living his life, doing cool things, sharing cool things on his Instagram page, you know, purchasing cool things, looking great in fucking clothes, designing great clothes, putting out bang after bang of collection, having great models walk the runway, having a fucking cool front row and people attending his shows and shit. And putting out these compilations of music, of course, people are going to think the brand is cool. And you're hoping with the cool points, that will equal to dollars in the till. Sales will go up and everybody wins. So big up, big up, Matthew M. Williams. Moving on, I've got this to talk about here, courtesy of How Long Gone. It's a bit of a long clip to play here, but it features a guy called Del Water Gap on episode number 547 of How Long Gone. And he's basically talking about something that I think about a lot when it comes to creativity and working within the arts, because unfortunately, working within this industry or this space that I'm currently occupying in, which means, you know, anything from design, from podcasting to DJing to content creation, it is really an unpredictable and um, a random space to be in. There is no one path to success. You don't have to go to school to do this. You don't have to do a particular type of thing to get successful. It just happens or it doesn't. But because of that unpredictability and uncertainty, people can sometimes hold on to that dream far longer than they need to and maybe there is a real strength in being able to accept that hey even though it's happened for loads of other people who are maybe far dumber than i am it just hasn't happened for me for whatever reason and i'm going to be grown enough to accept that's the case and move on to other things but it can be really hard to do so because unfortunately in this fucking world of the arts and creative stuff in the scene and shit sometimes at the point of you giving up it's right at the point that you get a breakthrough so what do you do do you keep holding on to your dream do you still try to become that rapper when you're fucking 35 or 45 or 55 years old or do you give up what is actually the strength? What is actually the real thing to do? And I think Del Water Gap on here speaks about it really clearly on how long on episode number five or seven. It's a bit of a long clip. I'm going to play in full so you can get a context of what he's speaking about. So my first show back out of COVID was actually at Red Rocks, which was crazy. I never thought I'd play a show again. Oh, and I went into COVID. I had a big career reassessment in COVID as we all did. You know, as many of us did. I was. Yeah, we, we Jason and I both did. We started a podcast. Oh, yeah. So we really there had a go. career reassessment. <laughs> yeah, real reassessment. But yeah, no, I mean, I, I a, a couple months in the pandemic, I started calling friends and being like, you know, I think it's time for my next move. You know, I, music was not happening for me. And I had been through a couple really unfortunate record deal situation you mean like the music wasn't coming to you or the it wasn't oh no it was career-wise it was the business career-wise i mean you know i yeah i have been at daughter gap for for a minute i started it when i went to college and um i had made a lot of records that i was really proud of but um yeah it just wasn't affording me the life that i wanted you know i, I was just sure. struggling all the time so i was like you know tell me <laughs> my next move and then of course as soon as i started looking elsewhere the the music career stuff started lifting as it does you know oh so you're saying you were gonna you were gonna go you were gonna finally chase your dreams of being a barista type vibe dude or? I, I was i was fully looking into becoming a cpa what fully. cpa what? yeah dude yeah <laughs> did your grandmother suggest this yeah who suggested no, my parents this? actually my parents sat me down and they had a like a printed brochure and they said <laughs> wait this, they said you know you seem really unhappy you know, we, we would pay for you to become a CPA if that's something you'd want to do. And I think I was like mentally ill enough at the time. <laughs> you know, I, was just like, I was like, just like, you know what? Fuck it. I was like, I probably the only guy that's ever said fuck it in the same sentence as CPA, but I did. And I said, fuck it. I'm going to be a CPA. Wow. When I look at it in retrospect, I was still looking at it through my poetic New York indie boy lens, which was this sort of einsteinian <laughs> fantasy right of i like this go on you t you twisted you twisted you were like i'm gonna be the first hot cpa yeah i'm gonna, I'm gonna, figure I'm gonna this be out. super mysterious i'm gonna sit in the corner 
I'm going to be scheming the whole time I'm writing my book. They don't know. Okay. But I'm writing my book. You would had a full fantasy created. You were ready to rock. <laughs> oh, yeah. I didn't know it, but, you know. I need I was my like, account I can... to be really scheming. You know what I mean? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I'm looking for. It's like, I could deliver this to a publicist, and they would slam it out of the park, you know? Yeah, I love I love, I love, love the <laughs> idea know? of you sitting in, like. Where I was at was I had called a few friends, and I had been like, yo, I've been really unhappy for a while and it was not a mystery to anyone. I had sure. made some records that I fucking loved. I still love. I mean, this record, Don't Get Dark, I put it out on this cool indie label and, you know, it got to people, more people in retrospect than I realized, but it, it you know, I was working like four jobs. I was catering. I was setting up photo booths, you know, fancy 4,000 a party photo booths and making sure people didn't break them. And I was doing tech support for old ladies. I was yeah. literally Photoshopping for my grandma's friends and setting up their Wi-Fi. And um, <laughs> such a nice boy, you know? Yeah. Damn. This is so sick. And then I would, and then I would rent this studio 6 PM to 6 AM from this guy, Justin Garish, um, who's a great mixer. And he, yeah, so I had the studio overnight so I'd go in at 6 p.m. and work all night, basically, and sleep during the day and then go to a job. And it was just not good for my mental health. And then amidst that, I was drinking a lot and I had a little bit of a benzo problem, which definitely did not help. And mm. I was watching Breaking Bad. Yeah, so that was the vibe. And then COVID started and I had this wonderful opportunity to check in with myself and and got got sober. And then this career stuff started happening online. I had one foot out the door. And then one thing after another... Uh, my my new manager called me and said, hey, you you have this opportunity to open for someone at Red Rocks. So my first show back after the pandemic was playing for 7,000 people at Red Rocks. And it was my first sober show. And it was the first time I ever cried on stage. And I, it was a version of maybe something you fuck, Chris, where like, you know, being, being sober gave me this ability to turn the knob up on some of my emotions. Like I felt emotional in a way again like moved in a way again that i hadn't in a while i'm dead you know? inside so, and i would agree with you yeah that that is that's that's absolutely yeah. true because you just don't have anywhere to hide what exactly made you cry when you were playing at red rocks just overwhelmed in general or was there like a specific moment or a song that made you made you crack a good question i'm it was a combination of things i think the overwhelming feeling was just that i had literally decided that i was never going to play a show again i was done playing music and I was okay with it. And I had accepted it. Mm -hmm. It was like, it was like seeing a loved one come back from the dead. It was a version of that for me. You know, music had been my whole life. It had been the only thing that I really cared about, you know, it, even to a detriment. Mm. I mean, I really sacrificed friendships and romantic relationships to, to, to become a great artist and to become a great writer and to become a great producer. And I had really come to terms with the fact of kissing that part of my identity, my life goodbye. And I think, Standing on stage at that particular venue, which I don't know if you guys have been there, but it's, you know, it's like a cathedral. It's one of what an amazing, 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 amazing story that he shared there. It's something that I feel like a lot of people can definitely, 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 definitely 120% recognize and sympathize with because it's an unfortunate state because unfortunately there is no clear path to anything or these type of things. You kind of have to just figure it out along the way somewhere. But usually I think maybe there is something to be said for letting go and then for it to be suddenly landing back in your feet again or in your lap there is definitely definitely something in it and maybe the strength of letting go the strength of being okay with kissing your dreams goodbye and then maybe getting back to some level of reality the fact that you went to be a cpa of all things after being a career musician is absolutely insane i don't think that's probably the right way to go about things maybe maybe in my opinion i would think especially if you're that late in your career and you haven't made it yet maybe doing a switch and doing just something super monotonous super monotonous monotonous sorry and also something Something repetitive and something that just doesn't require much brain power is maybe a better way to go about it if you want to do a regular job than maybe going and working in finance and stuff because that contrast is probably going to end up driving you crazy one moment you're on tour with your friends and stuff in a tiny van playing in clubs drinking all night and now suddenly you're in a cubicle do you know what I mean that kind of reality is probably a little bit too harsh but there probably is some strength and some utility in the idea of letting go and having coming being at peace with the fact that you know you can't have your dream right now and maybe trying to focus on something else and then hoping maybe along the lines that things can change change sometime when you have that other thing but you're not putting all your eggs in one basket you're not putting too much pressure on a thing that you're doing anymore and you've kind of just accepted where you're at but again how do you tell someone someone that something like that 
how do you even come to terms with it yourself you know what i mean is it loser mentality to have that kind of idea about yourself i don't really know but i've definitely seen um those things happen to myself i've seen it happen to other people and it's a really hard thing to kind of get your head around but i think for the most part if you have friends or whatever who are trying to you know pursue an art a career in the arts or an entertainment industry and stuff that's very hard to you know to figure out and they're in their old age or things have happened for them don't tell them to quit they probably know they should at some point if you don't want to offer words of encouragement because you don't think their work is good and you don't want to lie fair enough but just be a supporting hand if you can whatever way they go just try to support them in any way shape or form that you can support them but trying to you know make them snap out of it and come back to reality isn't the way forward because i think most people who, unless there's a super small delusional small amount but the most people out there we know we know when we're being delusional we know that we should probably go and figure some stuff out and get a regular job you're just hoping it kind of turns around for you and sometimes this kind of you know fairy tale story happens and you know just as a time that you're about to quit and take on this freaking cpa job which is interesting too because you know his parents are the ones that offered him the money um to go and do this cpa course which says everything you want about the arts right you can afford to take chances and live on the edge because you've got this you know you've got this sort of safety net with your parents and they can also save you when you decide to do a career move but most people can't but hey you know, sorry for another day but i think that kind of fairy tale story of oh i was about to quit and then suddenly i got this big you know gig to play in front of these thousands of people and then that led to other things that is not everybody's story I understand it isn't the case but it's good to know that we all kind of have these same sort of ruminations going through our head um, but I do like this bit of the story where he says oh I went to take this accounting job and my idea was to be like the coolest accounting uh, the coolest accountant or CPA ever I'm gonna go in there I'm gonna have a Tom Brown suit on I'm gonna be doing kind of finance podcasts like done the cool way and shit. it's like dude it doesn't it, it's not like that yeah you know i mean some jobs are just jobs you can't turn everything into a, an attempt to you know recreating the scene and usually i feel like sometimes having the contrast of having a really boring job and then going back to doing your creative thing can sometimes be quite beneficial to the work that you end up producing in the first place anyway so it just depends on what kind of attitude you want to take with these sort of things but either way i thought that was a good thing to kind of ruminate on for you those of you out there who are still chasing it and still hustling and hopefully that brought you some level of motivation in the stuff that you're doing so that has been the excellent English show episode number 712 as per usual if it's your first time listening to the show and you've enjoyed it thank you i appreciate it thank you for enjoying it thank you for being a fan and if you want to help out the pod make sure that you leave a five-star review down below you can leave it i think with all the podcasting platforms that are out there the major ones apple and spotify have a feature where you can leave five-star reviews and stuff or any star review that'd be greatly appreciated links to my patreon links to my social media can be found in the description as well as links to the stories i spoke about and you shall be hearing my tune of the day playing underneath my voice which is most likely gonna be water featuring tezo touchdown from the 10 10 17 alex 9sm compilation v1 mixtape that just dropped thank you for listening and i'll see you guys again very very soon take care peace